Right, things are heating up everywhere in this great Republic of Kenya. Despite the rains, in less than two days' time, it will be a uh, good Friday. But in 24 hours, the Saf WRC Safari mm -hmm. Rally kicks off. Oh, yeah. And of course, guys, uh, the Subaru guys were going to Vasha's. Uh, you better take off today uh -huh. because uh, you know that jam. Yeah, traffic jam that happens when everyone is heading to Naivasha for the rally. Oh, yes. Well, good morning and welcome to Morning Cafe. This is uh, TV 47. My name is Freddy Ndimuli. How hot is the coffee where you are? And I'm used to really standing here in Gita. Back then, uh, around 1930, when Fred was in the theatre. Fred, World Theatre Day. Uh, it is World Theatre Day. Okay. How, 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 how were the days then? Oh, yes. Uh, we used to do it under trees. Uh -huh. And uh, it was village theatre. <laughs> uh, but good times, though. Oh, yes, good times. I remember those days uh -huh. uh, uh, before World War II, just uh -huh. after World War I. So it was really good times. Nice memories there. <laughs> Taking me back, yeah? Oh, yes. <laughs> and we'll be discussing that uh, this particular morning. Uh, just you know, going back all the way in matters uh, theatre and also taking a look at uh, this new generation of how theatre is changing with the technology. And after that, we are cooking mashed potatoes and uh, meatballs. Oh. Yes. Right. Before that, quick look at the headlines this morning. Revealed faces of Shakahola's horror killings. That's a big headline on the standard this morning. Mm -hmm. On the Daily Nation, job losses as 140 state farms to go. We'll be telling you which state farms those are. Similar headline on the people daily, parastatal bosses in big trouble. It comes from that meeting between the president and the CEOs of various state uh, uh, institutes. On the next paper, Taifa Leo Majangili won a helicopter. So, uh, Hilo, Pale Rift Valley, Bonde la Ufa Kule. Kwingineko Magazine Zaidi, a business daily state takes on steel tycoons with new 220 billion shilling plants. Mm -hmm. Wow. The state is going into business, I guess. Uh, the paper, and now into the inters, we do start with Tanzania. Kampuni Thelathini Zaitaka Mwendokasi. And I always say in Tanzania, their big focus really is on matters of transport. Transport, yes. yes. The other Tanzanian headline, uh, all right, we could cross into Uganda first. I'm going nowhere. NUP has powers to recall Mpuga. That's a speaker. And he says, Hakuna mali anaenda. Maswala ya siyasa kule Uganda. Tuna gazeti zaidi. Still in Uganda, the Daily Monitor. Noisy yes. prayers land pastor in police cell. Uh, yes, the president had to respond through a letter and he asked quite a number of questions. So do you really think megaphones are the way to talk to God? <laughs> <laughs> That's a daily monitor. In and I just love the way Museveni runs that country. Uh -huh. On the star back home. Politicians fuel ethnic hirings in parastatals uh, has been focused on uh, three dailies. And just to wrap it up on the whole uh, bit of international uh, papers on Rwanda, how to bring more women into corporate boardrooms. That is in Rwanda. Let's take a look at uh, uh, the weather. So I'll start with uh, Fredo Lisema e-technology. Kidogo. Nayonea kwa mbali for now. Tutakaribia rupo nipo. We do start with uh, Nairobi and uh, see how things are looking like. So in Nairobi, uh, in most parts of Nairobi, Nairobi and its uh, metropolitan areas, uh, they say 18 degrees Celsius. And Google decided to give me in Swahili option today. So I think I'm just going to go with the flow with it. Nikiuma ulimi, tuapambana nalo. Halijotu ni kama... Kuminatisa uh, degrees so sasa ndiyo sijui uh, ni kapi. Uruzi. Nyuzi. Oh, nyuzi. Yeah. Ah, nyuzi. Nyuzi uh, kuminanane. <laughs> <laughs> Muhtasari uh, kuminanane. Ile ya juu kabisa leo ni kama uh, ishireni na ishireni na nane pale. Yo ni ya leo. Kwa hivyo maanisha leo sitarajie joto uh, nyingi sana. That's in uh, Nairobi, as of uh, today. Let's take a look at uh, uh, Kisumu. Tuwene ni nyuzi ngapi pale. Walesema halijotu ni kama nyuzi 24. This is how Tanzanians uh, do every single morning on the breakfast shows. Uh, kunyesha, dalili ya kunyesha leo, pale Kisumu ni, uh, ni zero. Na ni sufuri, sufuri bin sufuri. 
27 degrees Celsius is uh, rather 28 degrees Celsius is the highest uh, temperatures you'd be expecting if you're around uh, Kisumu. <clears throat> uh, now to the traffic. The traffic, just taking a look at how different interchanges will be looking like in uh, different parts of uh, Nairobi and different roads which would be interconnecting if you're heading to CBD or rather if from, C for, from CBD and just trying to access different parts of uh, uh, this busy roads as you can see uh, major most of them are really green so that means uh, not much to really report on some of this yellow just uh, traffic building up on some of this uh, highways and uh, some of these interchanges but uh, well, it's still too early, so do expect some of these yellow uh, lines to be building up into red, getting into the probably 8 o'clock hour. And that is the traffic for you. Let's get into the diary and uh, see what to expect as of today. So today, uh, on the first page of our diary, if you can have that on uh, your screens, the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. ESCC will be launching and releasing the National Ethics and Corruption Survey 2023. So the survey provides data on the perceptions, magnitude, forms and levels of corruption in Kenya, including ranking of government ministries, departments, agencies and counties so based on perceived corruption levels. And Fred, this is going to be a whole interesting because we've been seeing audit from Auditor General. So this is how they're using the money. But now, uh, from the ESS's report, we're going to really see so which uh, parastatals, and we're having you know, some of these uh, mm -hmm. headlines, so which parastatals are really affected when it comes to even corruption. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about it on a large scale, but now this uh, report, as it says, uh, just tackling a look at uh, even going into counties, uh, just seeing how deep is matters corruption. But then again, uh, I don't know how maybe true this uh, and we how deep it's going to be. We have all the data and we may have, uh, because today we'll just be prescribing or describing the problem. But we, know, yeah. we already know the problem is there. But uh, is that the way to go? What, what next after that? Mm -hmm. It's like we go to a doctor and uh, kwambia, uh, kuna malaria. What do we do about it? What do we do about it? That's a question. What do we do about it? So, yes, uh, many questions being asked about that uh, survey as well. Most definitely. ESC Chair Bishop David Oginda, as well as Commission's CEO uh, Twalib Mbarak, are expected to be the key speakers of uh, this event. And uh, this is uh, the day that uh, we're going to uh, be laying uh, veteran TV journalist uh, Rita Tinina, who passed away last Sunday, uh, will be buried at her family home at Nosupedi Farm, Ol Kirikirai, in Narrow County. So this morning, it's about uh, six times, so about uh, some 50 minutes from now, the cottage will be leaving a funeral home of uh, Umash Funeral Home and then going all the way uh, to Narok. And this funeral uh, service and uh, burial is expected to take place at around 10 a.m. And uh, as I'd mentioned, today's World Theatre Day, and uh, it was initiated in 1961 by the International Theatre Institute, ITI. It is celebrated annually on the 27th of March by International Theatre Institutes, as well as the international theatre community. So do expect uh, quite a various uh, theatre events locally uh, around you, nationally as well as internationally. Still on matters of theater and film, uh, the Kenya Film Commission will undertake the seventh edition of the Kalasha International Film and TV Market 13th edition of Kalasha International Film and TV Awards. And for the very first time, the Kalasha International Film and TV Festival from today all the way to the 30th of this month at the Kenyatta International Convention Center, that is KICC. From Matters Film and uh, Theater, let's get into sports now. And uh, today is uh, that day that uh, the whole funnel preps, Fred, of uh, WRC. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, the third round of this year's FIA World Rally Championship, popularly known as uh, the Safari Rally Kenya, and will be underway in and Naivasha, Nakuru County. So today is uh, that day that uh, they're just making sure everything is speak and span. If it is in the media center, if it is uh, in different parts, even here, so not only in Naivasha, because so tomorrow's, uh, tomorrow being the first day, there will be the ceremonial start in Naivasha, 
the whole KWS. But then on Friday, uh, we're going to be seeing the uh, special stage uh, starting in Kasarani, Nairobi, as witnessed uh, last week. So it is going to be uh, something to look forward to as well. And speaking of matters uh, rally, uh, today we do expect President William Rito to be presiding over uh, the launch of the Talanta Motorsport Academy at the Kenya Academy of Sports in Kasarani. So the event will be led by Sports Cabinet Secretary Ababu Namwamba. Meanwhile, uh, now into matters Parliament, what to expect as of today in different committees. So the Committee on Trade, Industry and Cooperatives is scheduled to have a meeting with the leadership of the Kenya Transporters Association. So this is in regards to allegations of mistreatment of local investors in the transport and logistics sector. Meanwhile, <clears throat> so the Committee on Delegated Legislation will be meeting with three cabinet secretaries. First off, cabinet secretary of interior, that is Professor Kithura Kindiki, and this is in relation to the refugees, uh, regulations 2024. And uh, so apart from that as well, I do expect uh, quite a number of issues to be raised here on matters uh, security, as well as, uh, and maybe even his proclamation when it comes to security, we do seeing a uh, few, some of these headlines on even Taifaleo's headline on uh, what is happening in the Rift Valley. So the fact that the CS interior will be there just to listen to what he might be saying. And uh, so apart from the CS uh, interior, do expect as well, Cabinet Secretary of Lands, that is Ali Sohome, on nine published regulations under uh, the Ministry of uh, Lands. Well, we may also be expecting Ohome to be uh, questioned on the same and what is happening in the ministry. And finally, on our diary, uh, this committee on delegation, delegated legislation will be meeting with Cabinet Secretary Mining and Blue Economy, that is Salim Vuria, on eight published regulations. So do I also expect uh, the Cabinet Secretary to be making some proclamations and uh, some questions that he really needs to answer. And finally, on our Today in History, I take you back to a day like today, uh, last year. And it was a whole running battles between the police as well as uh, anti-government uh, demonstrators. So most parts of uh, the country come to a standstill uh, with businesses affected, with the, also the central business district uh, coming to a close. Quite a number of shops uh, were closed. A number of, I remember that day, uh, even some of the papers were writing, stop this madness. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. That is today in history for you. And just before we delve into the dailies, uh, we'd like to make a special mention uh, to uh, for Harambe Stars, Kenya's Harambe Stars, oh, yes. uh, were crowned champions of the Four Nations Tournament yesterday after they beat uh, the Warriors of Zimbabwe 3-1 in a scintillating match held at the Bingu National Stadium in Malawi. So they were crowned champions. Uh, they beat uh, Zimbabwe. Zambia came third. And finally, Malawi were fourth. So to the Harambe Stars. Congratulations. Michael Lulunga scored a hat-trick hey. to mark his 30th birthday. Uh, oh, yes, by the way. Oh, yes. So to Michael Lulunga, congratulations. Akofi, kwa, kwa. All right. Let's now go to the dailies. After that, let to pick us in old Makofi. I'm holding a copy of the Standard newspaper today. It's quite heavy, 40 pages. I think the Daily Nation is also uh, quite big today. Wow, the Daily Nation is actually 48 pages heavy. So let's kick off with the Standard. Revealed faces of Shakahola's horror killings. Uh, the collection of bodies continues. For the first time, Kenyans are able to see the victims of the Shakahola massacre, from young children to women and men as a somber mood and girls' family is thronging Malindi Hospital mortuary to collect bodies of their loved ones. Remember, more than 400 people have been confirmed to have died in that area and buried. Uh, the investigations still continue, as well as matters before court. And finally, uh, families have started uh, collecting the bodies for burial. So yes, it is a very hard wrenching moment for those families who've had to wait for more than a year knowing that their kin had already passed on 
but that the bodies were, could not be released to them for burial. Uh, the highlights on the front page of the standard, why schools are closing a week early. They say pump, some public secondary schools will close this week, a week early in what head teachers say is a move to ease financial burden owing to delayed capitation money. And yeah, I know for the students they're celebrating, at least they'll get to experience Easter at home and not in school. Elsewhere, higher rents on the way for civil servants in government units. State plans to increase rents for civil servants living in 56,892 housing units across the country by up to 100%. And it is being revealed that uh, some uh, public houses are being occupied by civil servants. Uh, even in places like uh, State House Road, along State House Road in Nairobi, are paying rent as low as 30,000 shillings. And this will have to go up by at least 100%. Other highlights on the top strip of the standard, a man's two lives. In the red is U.S. In the red, uh, in U.S., a rich investor in Kenya, that story is on page two, in a Soma Kama movie. Yeah? Mm -hmm. The story of uh, this one person, and it's called Jeffrey Silandungi, who was jailed in the U.S. over a syndicate involving hacking, and the Asset Recovery Authority thought it had a field day. This is a very interesting story. Let's flip the paper to the back page. Matters WRC Safari Rally, which kick, kicks off tomorrow and will continue up until Sunday. Hyundai's Lapi Confident Esteem will conquer Safari Rally. The South Korean constructors say they have worked on their weaknesses that have seen them lose to Toyota on Kenyan soil since the championship returned to the country in 2021. If you look at the w WRC website, it says only four hours left mm -hmm. to the kickoff of this rally. So there could be some activities uh, today happening as well uh, as we anticipate the big rally in Naivasha. What we are Subaru, Anza Kutia Moto, Io Tarbo. What we are dust. Dust shall be seen. If, if uh, you don't confirm where your significant other is you shall as of yes. today. <laughs> today, I, I believe you, you, you have to actually go with the countdown of WRC. Uh -huh. So if the countdown is over and uh, you haven't confirmed where your significant other is uh, for this whole weekend, Think again. Uh, then you'll have to see what uh, uh, the migrants saw somewhere in Chalbi Desert back in the prehistoric times. <laughs> What they saw. What they saw. Okay. <laughs> That's the standard this morning. From the standard, let me take a look at uh, People Daily before I get into Daily Nation. And they say parastatal bosses in big trouble. And Ruto reads the Riot Act for non performing state uh, farm bosses to improve their fortunes uh, or be faced out. Was on page four. And uh, just below it, Aluta Continua. Doctors demonstrated in Nakuru streets yesterday against failure by the government to listen to their demands. And yesterday we did see different uh, unions, the Kenya, uh, uh, the clinical officers, the union of clinical officers, as well as uh, laboratory officers, uh, just saying, we're giving you a strike notice. By Sunday midnight, Mukomu merekebisha vitu, or else on Monday next week, PSCC to Wednesday, and uh, just get into the streets as well, and rather on the streets. Other highlights on uh, this front page of People Daily. On page two, you read that uh, civil servants in, a, in an info root shock over new house rents. And Safari Rally lovers troop to Naivasha on pages two and, uh, 26 to 27. And uh, they have uh, some cars there in a garage and tr just trying to ensure everything is a speak and a span. Oh, yes. Fred, have you ever had a chance to get into one of those uh, uh, vehicles of uh, Safari Rally? A rally car? I'd like watch, uh, to watch them from afar. But, but not get into uh, No. Uh, <laughs> it reminds me of, I think it was last time like this, when the president uh, had, had, had... Oh, yes. Entered. And you could see the fright on his face. Yeah. Even he was a bit scared. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that easy. <laughs> because I mean, the speed that uh, it was going, yeah. those people oh, yes. are daredevils. You cannot keep up with them. And it had Kenyans talking, and they're like, mm -hmm. uh, they wish they were the drivers in that. Well, something uh, you wish car. you never know.
Always. Be careful about what you wish for. <laughs> On the Daily Nation, job losses as 140 state farms to go. So they say facing the acts, thousands of workers risk losing their jobs in a renewed push by the government to merge or wind up parastatals that are performing similar functions or draining public coffers by being perennially in the red. It's bridges four and five on the same. And uh, just to uh, take a look at uh, maybe a mention of what is on pages four and uh, five. So uh, let me see, so uh, about 290, uh, they say, of parastatals that are currently in the country. So just to take a look at uh, from the 290, how many might be uh, slashed? And uh, so they say, so yesterday, uh, this paper established that 26 state corporations are financially dead and have been making losses in the last five financial years. So about 140 might be uh, merged and just slashed. Other highlights on this front page. At the very top, one president, two first ladies, meet Senegal's Basiru Faye. That's on page three. That's uh, quite an interesting one. <laughs> and there's a quote there by lawyer Miguna Miguna saying, Faye has smashed a well-oiled propaganda disinformation about African elections that only with the wealthy Western-backed entrenched families and deep state are capable of being presidents or prime ministers. And the new president is uh, pretty much young. It's only 44 years of age. Oh, yes. With two wives. He's an interesting guy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> One president, two first ladies, that's what they're saying. Oh, yes. Basiru Diamai Faye. Do you imagine if it was in Kenya? I mean, the, the fact that you always see we have uh, the functions of the first lady uh -huh. and, well, a number of people really uh, coming out and saying, well, do we even have the office of the first lady? Now, imagine in Senegal, uh, each first lady has, mm -hmm. they sit down and they decide, you focus on this project, I'm going to be focusing on this project. I think the biggest problem would be the proto handling the protocol. Who do you, yes. Whose name do you mention first? When you say first lady, <laughs> uh, you choose one name. Which one do you go with first? Sh shouldn't it or, be the or, first or wife? the president decide this is the first first lady and this is the second <laughs> first lady? <Wow. laughs> it be I, interesting. Probably it should be uh, the first wife. Who decides? All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, going to be interesting. That oh, is yes. uh, Basiru Diamai Faye, the president-elect of Senegal. Other highlights on this paper, before we cross over to others, still on the chop scroll of uh, uh, Daily Nation, half of young Kenyans would rather start businesses than seek employment. That is according to a uh, study, um, is on uh, page two of it, and they say, uh, so at least one in two young people in the country would rather start their own business than... Uh, be employed, and that is according to a study done by Partnership for African Social and Convergence Research, and as well as the MasterCard Foundation. On the right, uh, rather the left, uh, scroll, rent shocker for civil servants living in government houses and housing PS Charles Hinger tells Parliament that he has written to the Treasury seeking approval to review the rents for the government's 56,892 units that have remained unchanged for the last 23 years. On the bottom scroll, before we get into matters motorsport, and they say audit reveals grim reality of maternity hospitals in a county. And they just mention uh, but a few of what is ailing some of these maternity hospitals, including insufficient equipment, shortage of trained health workers, to a new needs having uh, to share incubators as mothers share beds. That is according to the Auditor General. And finally, on the motorsport uh, matters, Ndulele Shakedown gets the iconic WRC Safari Rally going. So the first real action of the Safari Rally begins today at uh, Ndulele Conservancy Naivasha, ahead of the rally's official start at the Kasarani Super Special Stage tomorrow. All right, that is what uh, to expect as of uh, today. On the back page of uh, Daily Nation, Alama's public schools failed to acquire science kits. Wow. And this is really matters the ailing CBC. The CBC lays emphasis on practical learning and aims to have over 60% of learners take STEM pathway in senior school. 
and uh, stems the whole science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. A final one on uh, the back page: President announces 13 billion cash shilling support for Tibets from China. Uh, that is uh, the Daily Nation. Tuangazi gazeti la taifa leo na zungumzia kuwa majangili wana helikopter ni swali pale. Maswali ya meibuka kuhusu wezekano wa majangili wanaohangaisha wakazi kaunti za Baringo na Samburu kufunufaika na huduma za helikopter ambazo kwa miaka miwili sasa zimekuwa zikionekana maeneo wanakojificha habari kamili kwenye ukurasa wa pili lakini kamishna ukanda wa Rift Valley ameamuru ndege hiyo inayotua eneo hatari idunguliwe na polisi. Wow. Habari kuu kwenye ukurasa wa mbele taifa leo. Uh, vidokezo zaidi familia za pokea mili shakahola kwingineko naibu waziri kulipwa milioni kumi kwa mwaka uh, wanajiita kas TSC motoni kuhusu ubaguzi na pale juu msako waacha magavana njia panda na kwenye spoti hofu city walker hofu city walker akijeruhiwa beki mahiri ameumia city ikijiandaa kukabili arsenal etihad Jumapili. Na hiyo ndiyo gazeti ya taifa leo. Leo. Right, back to matters parastatals on the star. And the politicians full ethnic hiring in parastatals and was in pages 4 and 5. The say report shows bosses continue to flood entities with tribesmen and women in disregard to the law. On the bottom, uh, matters the doctors strike enough is enough. Nakuru doctors demand posting of interns. On uh, the very right, uh, Triton scandal, arrest warrant for uh, Devani after oil uh, tycoon skips court. And in a Nairobi court yesterday uh, issued a warrant of arrest against oil tycoon Yagnesh Devani after he failed uh, to show up for a ruling in a case where uh, he is charged with 1.5 billion cash shillings fraud. So the warrant followed an application by the state. Uh, to rather after Devani missed the court session for the second time. And matters uh, Public Service Commission, so DPP to be fined for dropping cases in a new proposed law. And uh, the DPP might uh, be uh, fined if uh, this new proposed law is enacted into law. And according to proposed regulations, the DPP could be kicked out of office for dropping high profile cases without a proper explanation to Kenyans. We just uh, have that off and uh, continue matters of education, secondary schools, relief as state releases 23 billion cash links, school capitation. And uh, finally on this paper, on the very top, in case you're wondering why it's flooding, it, uh, wherever you are, uh, on page 20 of the star, no infl infiltration. Experts explain why Nairobi experiences serious flooding whenever it rains. And uh, they have a lady there, uh, probably that's a, a small house, and uh, had flooded in there. Wow. But imagine you're very busy sleeping at around uh, 3 a.m. and uh, you're just waking up by, you try to turn your head and uh, feel something cold. Kumbe ni maji mingia kwa nyumba. Sad, sad, sad state of affairs there. And that is uh, the star. Okay, uh, let's take a look at business matters on Business Daily today. State takes on steel tycoons with new 220 billion shilling plants. Project to be implemented by government-owned NMC. And the steel industry has been fighting price-fixing claims. So the government is now getting into that biashara as well. Of more interest, Housing Ministry moves to triple rent for civil servants. Civil servants who have been paying as low as 30,000 shillings monthly in rent for three-bedroomed houses located in prime locations will dig deeper into their pockets if the Treasury approves proposals to triple the amount. According to Principal Secretary Charles Hinga, he told Parliament that such public servants uh, living in upmarket areas like State House uh, area should be paying more than 90,000 to 100,000 shillings, up from the th current 30,000 shillings. Other areas, including the houses along Jogorod, where people have been paying 2,000, 1,000 shillings, that will go up as well. That's a big story on the front page of the Business Daily. Other highlights on the ticker. Electricity demand at record high on economic resurgence. Elsewhere, 
Electric mobility startup Basigo gets 395 million shillings to scale up electric bus manufacturing. Kenya Airways cuts losses by 40%. This is a new one on higher ticket sales. KQ narrowed its net loss by 40.6% to 22.6 billion shillings in the year ended December. Loss nonetheless. And finally, the NSC gains 96 billion shillings records, biggest single day jump in 18 months. And that's the business daily. And that leads us to the cartoons this morning. And I can see uh, Stanley already have the people daily uh, cartoon. Oh, On yes. page 10. We could uh, start yes. with that. Uh, trip up with them. It's a similar cartoon that we've seen quite a number of times there. People asking, where does the backstop? The government saying, help the backstops with you. And uh, similarly, the medic there holding a very huge, rather wrapping uh, around the neck, a very huge syringe and uh, saying on strike, he also says, help the back stops with you. And uh, very frail a patient there uh, on the sick uh, bed, she's also saying, help the back stops with you. So who really does uh, the back stop with? That's the people daily. That's Stano's take on the star. And they take you all the way to uh, Senegal, where they're having the young gentleman there, uh, Senegal's Basir Faye, Senegal's new president. And uh, he's breaking the glass ceiling. And uh, this is actually really, a, even just picking up from a quote by Miguna Biguna, uh, where you used to having African presidents, they're quite old. Remember, was it Nigeria? Uh, we even had it on one of our highlights. He was quite uh, frail that even read, reading his mm -hmm. uh, speech was quite uh, difficult. You know, he, he even had to uh, sit down fast oh, and yes. then read it again. And then we're having a young gentleman breaking the glass ceiling of uh, how African elections really are used to. That is uh, Basiru Fai, that is cartoon on the star. It is a similar theme on the cartoon on page 19 of the Daily Nation, what is happening in Senegal. And we have caricatures of uh, older or uh, current African presidents now assessing what has happened in Senegal. A number of them, about three of them, looking, uh, reading a paper written, Senegal imprisoned opposition candidate to president-elect. And there's another one who's trying to block the entry or the exit from a prison because this gentleman, um, Basiru Faye, was actually imprisoned mm -hmm. as an opposition leader, but he came out and managed to win an election. So yes, it is causing some jitters among the leadership in Africa. On the standard, the cartoon on, pa on page 16 of the standard uh, matters Kenya's politics and that apology. Uh, to the Kenyatta family and the former First Lady Mamangina Kenyatta by the Deputy President Rigathi Gashagwa. And it shows a caricature of the Deputy President uh, seemingly biting his tongue with uh, that apology. And there's a sign there saying Northland City Project. And uh, on one hand, his tummy is full from eating uh, <laughs> a lot of things that came probably from uh, that trade on that farm. And yes, <laughs> he's still offering an apology at the same time. And the, so you're apologizing and eating at the same time. Oh yes, and the, and That's the, a state of affairs. And the commentator is saying, hey, hey. hey, hey. <laughs> well, those are the cartoons on the dailies. And we'll be looking at some of these discussions with um, my panelists later on on State of the Nation. Do stand by for that conversation. Today we'll be having Josphat Kamanya and Daniel Rogo, political analysts. And you can be part of that conversation as well through our social media handles. But later on, we'll be cooking. Oh yes, later on we'll be cooking. Uh, Chef Haman uh, Peshu will be uh, joining us for that uh, conversation. And then, uh, but before that, we get into matters, a uh, conversation of our world of theatre day and uh, just understanding uh, how this has been. And uh, we'll be having, uh, let me just have them for you. So Ngobia Benson, a lecturer, performing arts at KCA University, as well as Mike Ndeta, who's an actor and a film director. So you can talk to us on our socials and tell us uh, what do you think about the whole theatre industry and other conversations that will be happening from right now, or the, from State of the Nation, all the way to Into Matters Cooking. Number 2047 is our SMS number. 0795045864 is the number to call in live at TV47KE on Facebook, at TV47 News on X, uh, Yanguni at Nyaringita underscore. 
My Twitter handle is at Fred Indemuli and we'll be having the news even as we prepare for State of the Nation. Do stand by and start tweeting, start texting what you think about the dailies this morning. tenure while issuing a strong warning to uh, loss-making parastatals in the country. So the head of state emphasized the importance of strict financial management in his quest to save at least 300 billion cash shillings in the current financial year. Mike Kagungo unpacks this for us. In yet another set of austerity measures announced by President William Ruto, state corporations could now be forced to readjust their spending with laws making ones facing the possibility of being shut. The president now pushing for profitable organizations to reduce unnecessary spending and return earnings to the government. We must deal firmly and decisively with pilferage and wastage and theft and the so evident corruption. Speaking at the State House here in Nairobi when he met chairs and CEOs of state enterprises, the head of state emphasized the negative consequences of sustained losses on the country's economy. Those institutions that are making losses, they have no plan, they have no intention of uh, doing anything. Please, we will shut them down. We will get the employees to go and work somewhere else. And we just stop making the losses. At least we will stop making the losses. The president directed commercial state corporations to pay the national treasury 80% of their income after taxes with specific instructions on how to distribute the remaining 20%. He further said 90% of excess funds should be remitted by regulatory institutions and severe enforcement required to guarantee that everyone complied. The commitment of the president to restore our economy calls for serious attention to the matters that will be raised here. So take this forum very seriously this early morning and whatever will be given as a policy direction Please do go and give it your all. Last week, the Salaries and Remuneration Commission Chairperson Lynn Mengich, while speaking at a cutting raiser event before the third National Wage Bill Conference, said the Commission had identified reasons why the country's recurrent budget remains high, adding that the conference will provide solutions to ensure there is prudent use of public funds. Mike. Kagwongo TV 47, Nairobi. Good morning. Andrew, medical uh, ailing of the whole health crisis. As the doctor's strike entered the 13th day of a nationwide strike on Tuesday, clinicians and laboratory officers have vowed to join the strike accusing the government of failing to implement a raft of promises from a collective bargaining agreement signed in 2017. And as Chichi Josephine now tells us, the 2017 CBA was signed after a 100 day strike that saw people dying from lack of medical services. The country is staring at alarming health crisis as clinicians and laboratory officers have vowed to join the ongoing doctor's strike. The Kenya Union of Clinical Officers issued a seven-day strike notice accusing the national and county government of failing to keep their end of the bargain. We formally give both levels of government, that is the county government and the national government, seven-day strike notice for the following reasons. One, failure by the government to formulate a recognition agreement with the union, despite having met the requisite, requisite of the law, even after several attempts to have this matter solved amicably. Failure by both levels of government to confirm all universal health care coverage staff, all UXC interns, COVID health emergency response program, 
the National TB Lung and Disease Program. Doctors from the South Rift region held demonstrations in a court town on Tuesday, stating that they shall not return to work if their demands are not met by the government. But today, we plan for this peaceful demonstration to also try and push the government to see the sense in the suffering that the common Monainchi is going through on issues that can be solved even a day. The Kenya Medical Practitioners, Pharmacists and Dentists Union KMPDU Secretary General for the South Rift Region Dr. Stephen Omonde led the demonstrations accusing the government of failing to implement its promises from a collective bargaining agreement signed in 2017, among other demands. The main that we are focusing on are like five. One is the posting of the interns as per the CBA of 2017-2021 that we agreed. It's outlined how they need to be employed, the days they need to take, it has taken much, and what they need to be paid. In Meru County, they cautioned governors against intimidating doctors, adding that the priority of the county bosses should be settling over due basic salary payment and assisting doctors in advocating for increased funding from the national government to support county health care services. This is only 500 doctors. Meru County needs a total of more than 2,000 doctors. I would be impressed, Mr. Speaker, mkituwekea budget kidogo, ya billion kidogo, we will be able to absorb all these comrades now in our hospitals. At the same time, Embakasi East Member of Parliament Babu Owino unveiled a team aimed to address citizen issues on Tuesday. Speaking during a press conference, Babu cited laxity within the opposition team in Kenya defending his reason for creating a new team which he said aims to address the ongoing nationwide doctor strike. I want to tell you that if you don't move with speed, we will move with speed. And this is a new team, the young blood, the fresh breath, that is going to breathe breath into the dry bones of the problems facing Kenyans. Chichi, Josfin TV, 47. Seven out of the 400 bodies exhumed from the Shakahola Forest in Kilifi County have been released to their families for burial. Government pathologist Johansen Odor has, however, revealed that only four bodies have been released uh, to uh, families. This, even as the government intensifies investigations into the Shakahola massacre, where self-proclaimed preacher Paul McKenzie allegedly lured his followers to uh, fast to death. Take a look. In a somber yet necessary move, the government has begun the process of releasing bodies of the Shakahola massacre victims to their respective families for burial. This comes after a painstaking exhumation effort that began last year, April, following the shocking discovery of 429 bodies buried in mass graves. We want to say that there has been effort uh, to try and make this as humane as possible. The families were cancelled at, at the moment they arrived. Uh, there was a process of registration of the families and then they were brought and they were shown their bodies. In groups went in, uh, they went in, in small groups so that they could be handled by Red Cross effectively. So, uh, as some of them were very overwhelmed uh, by seeing the bodies. Today marks a bittersweet moment for some families as seven of those bodies have been handed over for burial. Four of them have been received by one grieving family in Malindi, while two others have been viewed by separate families, including one in Western Kenya. The families are not able to receive the bodies of their loved ones due to logistical challenges. <laughs> Mimi nimetoka Meru na kupeleka mwili mmoja kutoka hapa mpaka Meru ni kama laki moja na nusu. Na mimi mtu si ni mwanzo sina kazi. Kazi yangu ni ya uchuzi ya kuuza kahawa na basically ndio huwa na uso. Hata nikapewa hiyo mili mili yote yote nikapewa ndio hii sina uwezo wa kusika. Kwa hivyo kama serikali hawataweza kutusaidia. Mi sina uwezo wa kusika hiyo mili pengine niwaachie. Lakini ningeomba watusaidie. Tusitiri hiyo mili tupumzike roho zetu. 
government pathologist Johansen Odor has revealed that a total of 35 mass graves were identified during the exhumation process. Of the 429 bodies recovered, only 34 have been positively identified so far. The Shakahola cult made headlines last year when its leader, Pastor Paul McKenzie, allegedly instructed his followers to stab themselves in a misguided attempt to meet Jesus. Mackenzie was arrested on April 15, 2023 and has been in police custody ever since. Anne Odida, TV 47. Right back to the whole health crisis and with an ongoing doctor strike across the country, it's now clear that Kenyans who are unwell continue to carry the heaviest burden. So the patients who are unable to get health services and are requesting uh, the government to intervene and adjourn uh, the iron out the issues raised by doctors. Kenya is still tittering on the brink of a health catastrophe as doctors in public facilities continue to down their tools demanding better working conditions, implementation of collective bargaining agreement, posting of medical interns and a medical cover. The doctor's strike which has halted health services in public hospitals has subjected Kenyans to suffering with many unable to get services at different public facilities in the country. In Taveta constituency, Taita Taveta County, we meet a resident Danson Warombo who has a leg injury but due to unavailability of doctors in the hospitals, he has been forced to get medical attention from home. I am a na nikapelekwa hospitali lakini sasa sikupata madaktari hawakuwa sasa na huku bado navuja damu mguu umeumia sana according to Danson, his condition forced him to find a private health center but due to lack of enough funds he had to return home where his wife had to take the responsibility of nursing him ndio ambaye nimetumia kwa sababu nilikuwa nimeenda private nilifanywa dressing pale nikafungwa mguu na nikaona nazidi kuumia hata nikienda hospitali maana tumeambia madaktari hawapo basi nikawa najitibu nyumbani kwa sababu sina pesa ya kujitibu zaidi nikawa najitibu tu nyumbani kuoshwa mguu kufanywa dressing na bibi yangu hivyo hivyo tu na mpaka ukafikia mali nimefikia sahi kidogo na kanyaga Danson and his wife are currently urging the government through the Ministry of Health to intervene and address the grievances of doctors in order to revive the health sector. Kwa kuambia uh, madaktari ni warudi tu kwa kazi yao kwa sababu bila hivyo tunazidi kuumia. Watu ambao tuko tuko kwa kifedha tunazidi kuumia kwa sababu kama sina hiyo pesa ningekuwa nayo angeenda pengine mali kwingine atibiwe lakini sasa kulingana na hiyo pesa huna pesa ya kukusaidia uh, wito wangu kwa serikali na sema kwamba wafanye hima waongee na madaktari ili watu wengi wasija kaumia sana waongee na wachukize matako ya madaktari watendee haki yao ili wapate kurudi watu wengi wa ambaye ni maskini hasa wataumia sana Nelson Mwareza TV 47 and still in the whole, uh, the whole breath, tens of people demonstrated outside Bandera Referral Hospital demanding that the county government intervenes on a matter where police officers who survived Monday's terror attack were uh, airlifted to Nairobi, where other survivors were left in Mandera. And as Paul Kirobi reports, the residents at one point had to block an ambulance ferrying injured officers. A day later after a serious al-Shabaab attack in Mandera, residents took to the streets along the road heading to Mandera Referral Hospital, complaining of what they term as being discriminated against by the county government. Angry residents obstructing ambulances transporting police officers injured in the Monday explosion in Mandera town. For instance, this ambulance could not manage to move due to the irate mob. Families of the blast victims hospitalized decried alleged discrimination, claiming that only two police officers were airlifted to Nairobi for specialized medical care, yet their loved ones were not given priority. Residents want all the victims who were injured yesterday to be transported to Nairobi's Kenyatta National Hospital to receive medical treatment. Security 
yoyote mwenye anaweza tusaidia hakuna chochote serikali ndio ambao tusaidie watu ambao tumewaacha hapa ndani wengine wako under critical condition na wanahitaji matipapu ya darura yes. according to police officers the blast that happened in Mandela town which shares the national border with Somalia was caused by an improvised explosive device that had been planted at the hotel four people including three police officers were reported dead and 11 others injured in a suspected terror attack on a small hotel located near a police station the latest attack followed another one on sunday in the coastal county of Lamu where two police reservists were killed paul kirobi tv47 at Mata's leadership and governance coming up in uh, the whole state of the nation with Fred Ndebuli. Political analysts uh, Joseph Kamanya as well as Daniel Rogo are in the building uh, looking smart and looking uh, sharp, uh, flipping through the papers and just seeing what is happening. They'll be coming your way. Remember, you can always be part of this conversation. Start texting us. Start tweeting TV47 <coughs> on X as well as 22047 on our SMS number. See you at around 8 a.m. as we talk about Mata's World Theatre Day. Goodbye. This morning, we're privileged to have Daniel Orogo, a political analyst in studio, and Josphat Kamanya, also political analyst. Karibuni sana, good morning. 
Good morning. Um, yes, I know the dailies look... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the headlines are quite varied. Uh, on one hand, the standard has decided to go with the faces of some of the victims of the Shakahola massacre on the front page. Matters to do with the schools closing early and the higher rents for civil servants. On the Daily Nation, uh, that meeting between the president and the heads of various government parastatals features prominently the government, uh, President Ruto announcing plans to shut down loss-making state corporations. Um, and uh, an audit revealing grim reality of maternity hospitals in counties. We've gone slow. We've actually really slowed down on political headlines. And th this has been happening since Raila Odinga um, confirmed his bid for the AUC position. Um, so, yes, we may be struggling to look at political <laughs> headlines now that we have political analysts in studio, but uh, definitely some political news to look at. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the cartoon on uh, the Daily Nation and probably we'll start from there. It's on page 19 of the Daily Nation. And it has to do with what is happening in Senegal. Mm -hmm. So, yes... The story on the Daily Nation talks about from prison to palace, Basiru Diomaye Faye's road to Senegal's presidency. There's a wind of change blowing in Africa, especially in West Africa, and we've seen, especially coming from last year, the latter months of uh, uh, last year with the changes in Mali, Niger, and other countries. Now we're seeing uh, what's happening in Senegal. And a young man, Yes, he has two wives, but doesn't mean he's old. He's only 44 years old. Uh, he's set to take over as the president of Senegal uh, at 44 years of age. That's quite something. And um, the cartoon on the page 19 of the Daily Nation uh, speaks to the unease that this uh, could be causing to the other leaders in Africa currently. These are caricatures of uh, the current presidents in Africa, and I can identify a few. I can see Yoweri Museveni of Uganda, I can see Paul Kagame of Rwanda and uh, the president of uh, Congo, uh, Congo Brazzaville. What's his name? Uh, this is Sasun Gweso. Is it Ngweso? Yes. Ngweso. That's Ngweso. On the other hand, we're seeing uh, others trying to block the entry or exit from prison, uh, trying to ensure that uh, prisons are more secure. Uh, people don't come out of prison and uh, <laughs> run for president. Let's start from there. Um, definitely something refreshing. Uh, you can see that uh, what we've seen in um, last year, especially with the coups, and now we're seeing this one through a democratic process, uh, Africa going for younger leaders and probably not for the status quo, going for people who ideally would not be uh, the presidents um, as far as people expect. So what, what does this mean for Africa? Are we experiencing... Uh, an awakening of some sort, Daniel? Uh, well, um, I, I think like you've alluded to, this is, this is a very refreshing uh, image and uh, it, it breathes some fresh air on the state of uh, you know, leadership in, in Africa. Uh, well, you understand that it has been documented that there's going to be almost uh, 80 or elections that is going on uh, you know, globally, but 19 in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, for the year between 20, late 2023, last year to 2024, that has been documented, the number of elections, 19 elections in Africa. That means mm -hmm. that the quarter of the whole continent uh, is expected somehow to get, new uh, to get new leadership, but far more is to allow the citizens to participate and uh, you know, give their voices and you know, have an electoral result like this. Now, one of the things that you could also see is that this is far West Africa, uh, where there is a the background of young leaders arising, taking over uh, the leadership in form of uh, you know, uh, coup d'etats, uh, like it has happened in Guinea, uh, that has happened in uh, you know, um, Burkina Faso. Uh, we're also seeing that happening you know, in other countries, either Central Africa, or West Africa. But this is, this is very refreshing in a sense that West Africa that has been touted as, you know, as a background of uh, coup d'etats, uh, Senegal has risen up, uh, you know, to show the world, especially West Africa, that in the background of, you know, these military coups and the threat to unconstitutional change of power, uh, that we can have people participate 
in and democratic election processes and have their leaders that they want. But this is coming at a cost. It's coming at a cost when uh, there was uh, politically motivated charges that were put mm -hmm. in Mr. Fai and of course his uh, counterpart coalition partner uh, who has been the opposition leader for Senegal, Osman Sonko. And he's not coming at a really, you remember the attempted uh, that uh, President Macky Sall had already attempted to push forward these elections more than twice. And people rose up in power. Others, uh, you know, lost their lives in the streets, you know, claiming for democratic space. But also, what is the implications of this in the continent? It shows that however much we, you know, democracy, uh, you know, um, has got its own weaknesses and challenges. Because one of the conversations I have in different platforms is what kind of democracy works for Africa? Mm -hmm. This is another conversation that, you know, um, uh, political pundits must put into scrutiny because not Western democracy is working for Africa. There are sense in which democracy has been a baggage to African countries because it has onboarded some very bad manners. And you can hear some of these particular Africans, citizens, uh, you know, uh, there was a time they were, they were saying that it's better to have a constitution ch and constitution change of power. If the establishment is not yielding into a democratic ideas, okay. then they see that because also democracy has become, you know, um, has been seen as election, as a whitewashing, you know, big men, you know, importing, uh, you know, trying to meddle in the election because election sometimes seems to be a washing factor for some cr criminal mm -hmm. enterprises to ascend into power because the Western powers have only recognized the leaders that are rising out of elections. Mm -hmm. So what do that do? It means that this bad leadership and you know, um, you know, uh, people who had acted uh, as heads of military and extreme nationalists now decided to go for elections. Military men going for election and rising in power mm -hmm. and now saying we are democratically elected. Okay. So there are a lot of questions that comes into mm -hmm. power, especially now the threat to people who've stayed in power for a long time has been captured by this cartoon. Okay. Uh, Kamanya, let's bring it uh, closer home uh, to, to the region. Uh, Rwanda is expected to go to elections this year, I think in July. Uh, next year, Tanzania will do the same. Then I think the following year, Uganda, then Kenya later. And um, should we be reading anything uh, from our West African uh, counterparts? Well, I think uh, Senegal is beginning to um, set pace for the concept of Africa rising. Because for a long time, we have always believed that it is until uh, other external forces like the Western and the European uh, regions mm -hmm. come and shape our political path, can only we proceed. Mm -hmm. But we are changing that narrative, and I love the, how the, the Western part of the continent is, is coming out. Uh, if you look at Niger and all those, Burkina Faso, and now we have Senegal. Uh, it is about time as Africans, we stand up and own our democratic space because democracy can only be built and homegrown for it to last and have an effective uh, uh, change. So bringing it home closer to our East African region, if you look at the current presidents that we have other than the Kenyan president, uh, I think uh, Kaguta Museveni came into power when he was around that age mm -hmm. of 40s, same as Kagame. It's only that they have overstayed in office much it's a reserve of those uh, citizens to decide whom they want. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the, the, how they have handled democracy, it has been alarming. You look at Uganda, uh, remember Bobby Wine? For a long time he's been uh, beaten up, sent to prison, mm -hmm. uh, held on house arrest, just for him not to participate in the election, uh, electioneering process. You look in Uganda, you've seen them have a change of constitution from I think it was four years earlier on, now it is seven, and then it is almost none, uh, it's, it's a never ending uh, change that keeps coming. So it is worrying for the citizens of these nations of our, uh, the East African region. But what I know is that Africa has also become a very woke continent. We have a lot of youth who have now chosen to get involved in the politics of the day. And that's why you see even, uh, if you look at the numbers, because I was trying to follow the, the, the Senegalese uh, voting pattern, a lot of young people are out. Mm -hmm. When elections were deferred, they came out saying, no, we want to vote. And this, uh, some, some of these uh, younger people do not necessarily believe in this democracy mm -hmm. as uh, given to us or brought to us uh, by 
bigger nations, uh, the US and the Western world. Yeah. Uh, th th there seems to be an, um, a need to craft our own uh, system of democracy. Uh, do, you, do you think we, 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 we've started that journey? That's correct. Like I said, you know, any lasting democracy has to be homegrown. Mm -hmm. This imposition of leadership and policies just goes as far as the interests of the imposer go. Mm -hmm. But now we are beginning to resist and say, no, as Africa, as the youth of the continent, we need to shape our future because leadership begets development. All these public policies which we keep talking about from Egypt all the way to Cape Town, it is because of the leadership, failed leadership, I dare say, that we've had since the 1960s. Okay. Because it's been a, a continuation of the colonial system. Mm -hmm. Now is when the colonial system is beginning to collapse. Okay. And uh, the only way they've been trying to infiltrate, this is the, now the European nations, is by imposing leaders that will serve their interests. I, I, I want to focus more on the western region of the, of the continent. A lot of resources go to Europe, mm -hmm. from gold, lithium, cobalt, all those. But these countries are the poorest. Come to East Africa, we expect coffee, I mean, we export coffee and teas, but how much do our farmers get? Mm -hmm. where, the, where is the market? It's not even in Africa. Go down all the way south, they still have the minerals. People still work in the, in the mines. Uh, mega pay is what they have. Uh, you have a reserve of townships and slums, for the Africans who dwell in those nations. But the high-end estates, they belong to other people. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this kind of socio-economic change can only be, be dealt with if you have proper leadership. And people want young people that they can identify with. Mm -hmm. And 40 is not young. It is a beginning of assuming communal responsibilities because now you have had your fair share of exposure. We would assume you're done with the education. You have assumed a few positions of leadership. You understand how the matrix works. Yeah, okay. So I'm happy with Senegal. I do hope that it's going to bring a very good uh, socio-economic change for the country and then set pace for the continent. Quick question. Uh, something is happening in Uganda uh, with the president appointing uh, his son, Muhozi Kairenu Gaba, as the chief of defense forces. There's been talk about uh, Muhozi succeeding his father uh, in the country's leadership, and uh, this is the same conversation we're having. Yes, it's matters transition. Muhozi is uh, relatively young, uh, but uh, it's a method of uh, how it's going to be worked out mm. that probably many people are concerned about. But uh, if at all we need to look at homegrown, uh, systems of governance. Uh, it could also work for Uganda, if at all that's a method they choose to go with. But, but, but I think, uh, as, as we put it, is that you know, when, when we're talking about homegrown solutions and uh, uh, you know, us customizing in, uh, you know, um, uh, dom democracy that works, because then there is an issue about democracy as it is and democracy as, as it should be, or it works uh, when it's contextualized in a certain country or a region. Uh, they believe that leadership is, is a reserve, you know, um, to certain individuals who probably are related mm -hmm. uh, to those who probably were fighting, uh, you know, um, for independence of those particular countries or rose up in arms and saved the country from a certain unique situation. Mm -hmm. And therefore, th there is a systematic belief that the political system and political enterprise would would want to fund this kind of, you know, and fund this kind of succession to leadership. So I believe when you're talking about a homegrown solution is that the citizens, while the majority, you know, um, who are the citizens of those particular republics are able to make their view towards the type of leadership they want and maintaining the structure through which this leadership are, you know, got into power. But I think there is a systematic, approach that establishment are taking to infringe on their right to participate in these kind of electoral processes, which, which breeds a lot of dissatisfaction, which breeds a lot of conflicts and disagreement and contempt towards you know, electoral establishment you know, systems. But that is what my colleague Amanya has just mentioned, um, uh, you know, um, which, which you see that from independence in the 1960s, um, the issue that Western establishment had been having a strong hand in the post-independent period uh, to try to impose the kind of leadership and kind of democracy that would maintain a status quo, that which is relatively acceptable to the citizens but do not disrupt the interest of the West mm -hmm. as well, that which a balance between a political economy and democracy and the rule of law that any other you know, figure that rises 
uh, whether he's a young person, whether he's a strong nationalistic leader, or whether he's just anyone, then you could see that as much as the West were conflicted on what kind of democracy. And now that you're bringing it close to East Africa, you, you probably see what happened in the Democratic Republic of Congo in 1960s, reading through the history of Congo and, and, and the resources. And by the way, you should know that DRC's wealth and resources is enough to feed the whole of Africa. Mm -hmm. It's enough to feed the whole of Africa. Only DRC, if, if you look keenly into it. Mm -hmm. but, but, but you are looking at the succession post-independence, the fear about the likes of Lumumba getting into power when the West mm -hmm. and the Belgians were comfortable having the likes of Kasavuvu in power, as opposed to Lumumba, who was very radical in his policies and even establishment within. And that goes beyond, you know, what kind... And, and let me tell you that these Western powers and Western establishments sometimes are even comfortable with these cool leaders having in power. Mm -hmm. And as long as the interests are not threatened, as, as long as there is establishment, is that not the understanding, general understanding of democracy, that as, far, as, as long as a majority are comfortable with this mm. and actually say, fine, uh, we as a majority, because majority have to have their way, mm. as long as a majority are comfortable with, with whatever system you have chosen, mm. yeah. mm, then that is correct. No, well, no, uh, as, okay. as Dan says, and I agree with him, there is democracy as defined to us, and there is democracy as it should be for us. Mm -hmm. Because again, remember what is good for, the, uh, for our neighbors should not be uh, automatically correct for us. Yes. Democracy has become a concept of modern colonization. That's how I see it. Because as we, defined to us. As defined to us. We have seen, especially the West and the Europeans, go to the Pakistans, Afghanistan, and say we are going to deliver peace. And then there is war in Iraq endlessly for a decade or two and people are dying. Uh, look at what is happening in Israel and now they talk about uh, Hamas. They no longer talk about Palestine, which is a country, it's a state that has people. But if you ask them, it is democracy. They're trying to bring peace to the world. Who gave them the reserve? Mm -hmm. Who gave them the definition of what is good for the rest of the nation? Now, that's how war, and war is a very lucrative industry. It has to be maintained that way. Because the opposite of democracy is war. That's, that's, those are the two options mm -hmm. you're given. It's either you assume a democratic process, or there is going to be war. Look at what's happening in Somalia. If Somalia was left to have a democratic process homegrown by the Somalis and they vote for their own political system and leadership, that country is well enough to upgrade the GDP of the entire East African mm -hmm. region. Same thing goes for the DRC. DRC can give the rest of Africa clean water for free, mm -hmm. for free. But today water is more expensive than milk in Kenya. So when you look around at the de definition of democracy, and what democracy ought to be. That is where we have to We seem to be on. struggling with the same uh, conversation even here in Kenya. Yeah, yeah. Yes. But even the, whole, the definition of our governance system is yeah. something that is clouded mystery and confusion even to our own leadership. That's why we're talking about leader of official opposition on one hand and the <laughs> minority vis-a-vis -vis ma majority in, yeah. in parliament. Mm. If we bring this conversation to Kenya, is it time that we change an approach and we have an honest conversation on the system of governance that works for us, not necessarily as defined to us by the colonialists. But, but I think that is, we, we have been advocating for that mm. a long time in this set, uh, Fred. Uh, you, the, the issues about us having a national conversation and you got the state of governance and state of democracy. And, 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 and you see, it, it's quite a very big concept for this thing called democracy because people define it differently and you, you even see the definition of democracy is quite important. You know, mm -hmm. Even it's the definition, the discourse about democracy is. And even those we're quoting that are paragons of democracy, mm -hmm. it, it's no African leader has been put as a paragon of democracy. I mean, democracy has been, you know, placed in the head of Abraham Lincoln, for example. A misplaced idea you know, for Africans. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so when you mention democracy, in, in the list of democratic leaders, if you put the face of Africans, even Africans and Kenya themselves are like, hmm, can I really attribute democracy mm -hmm. to this kind of a leader? So I think for us is also to try to decolonize, you know, the definition of democracy 
and mm. customize that even before, and I can tell you, look at how we were managing even our own electoral issues mm. before independence. Traditionally, if you can attribute that to your village, elders were sitting and having a consensus on mm -hmm. the issue. There's a way conflicts were being resolved. There's a way people were being elected to some position. It could not have been an election where people line up and put mm -hmm. a ballot. But there was a way we were electing our leaders to different councils in traditional, you know, these councils. But then there is a conceptualization that, you know, the whole issue about colonization and decolonizing Africa has missed out to define and demystify what this democracy as it should be in Kenya or in Africa works. But also, let us also, if we try to make that an attempt, then democracy as a concept is not finally arrived by people having their voices, minority having their, mm -hmm. their voices, uh, minority having their voices, the majority having their way. I am a proponent of, look at the tenets of democracy. There are quite tenets of democracy to be discussed. The rule of law, how do we measure it? Let's measure it as, as, as it is. You know, the will of the people, the independence of the judicial yeah. institutions, yeah. the independence of free press, are we looking at where the parliament can make their decision independently mm -hmm. without being customized as, as an arm of the executive? Mm -hmm. Are we looking at where the citizens, and this is where we're having a problem. The backbone of our democratic participation is when the citizens are able to understand, you know, the kind of system they are in, the level of decision they can make, and when they can rescind to their decision and become accountable to their action. Mm -hmm. In this sense, do we have education that make citizens be civically competent and are able to take their responsibilities and acknowledge the obligation? Okay. That for me is a democracy that works. Today we're gonna, we, we'll, we'll see the ESCC and the ODPP's office release the corruption and ethics uh, survey report. And one wonders with this conversation we're having about uh, democracy and the imports of democracy on our governance structure, um, there seems to be a general failure um, over the last uh, one, two years to really tackle corruption. It would appear that we look like we've given up on that fight. Uh, it's no longer a big deal. It's part of our system. Let's move on. That was not, could that really be uh, a direct result of failure in the governance system, that uh, something that is so glaring, uh, glaring uh, glaringly wrong mm -hmm. in our system, but we cannot handle it because the majority are looking elsewhere. It's quite saddening when you see the leadership of a country, uh, in this case Kenya, uh, concede to the fight against corruption. Because you'll hear the leaders say, you know, these cartels, uh, unbreakable, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, we keep losing money to corruption. Yet you are the leader of that uh, either ministry, institution, or nation, in this case, Kenya. So you would ask yourself as a civilian, so what am I supposed to do? And on the other, uh, on the other end, you have, uh, you're being pressed on to pay your taxes, uh, to file all the, the statutory deductions, they come off your salary if you're an employed person, but then you're assured that a certain percentage of that money is going to just disappear to some funny characters and accounts and nothing will be done by the government. So I think I'm not excited about what is going to come out because you can expect there'll be levels of uh, corruption that will just not be addressed even thereafter. But Remember again, when you are, the campaigns were very high, they were on, uh, the former president used to say we were losing two billion every day. And then we used to ask, why are you telling us? What do you want us to do? You're the president. You have the judicial system, you have the police, you have the anti-corruption. And every year a report comes out. For how long are we as a citizens going to sit down and watch our resources just go to, to waste? It is about time that all the unions, all the the, the organizations and, I mean, we call them the public, uh, those who advocate for public, the utilization of public resources. Mm -hmm. It's about time we hold them to task. Because we cannot have doctors on the streets today, meaning our patients are not being attended to. Yet on the other end, today we are going to have a report that says we are bleeding money mm -hmm. as a country.
And then we keep on borrowing money to repay our debts. What needs to happen? It's about time as Kenyans we rise and hold our do, government. Do, do you feel a sense of helplessness when it comes to some of these discussions? I, it, yes, democracy has given us a way of electing these leaders. So we elect leaders and we sit back and we're so helpless that you're watching something go wrong, uh, so significantly wrong, but there's nothing we, do, we can do about it. But uh, we as a majority had our say and had our way, um, that uh, an issue like uh, corruption, whether or not the current administration chooses to address it, well, it is the administration we chose for ourselves. Democracy should be, uh, it should, it should yeah. be able to provide solutions. It's yeah. not just democracy for the sake of it. Well, 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 I, think, well I think people's, people's participation in people's power, as, as, as it in envisioned in Article 1, in Chapter 1 of the Constitution, Chapter 1, Article 1, um, you know, should, ought to have been exercised, both in light and spirit, that we do not only quote it uh, when we are confronted, you know, with uh, you know, academic responsibility or intellectual, mm -hmm. you know, uh, responsibility to justify why some actions needs to be done. Probably that has only been happening, especially during elections and after elections when we feel that the outcome of election do not reflect you know what our views are. That's where you. This 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 phrase comes a lot when you know, when people feel that their rights are threatened, especially their rights to make political decisions, which includes you know that which is voting for their leaders. But then after that, I believe we are cultured in a sense that our active participation in national life in affairs of a nation is really limited, as we are headed to election. After that, that's and then after election, probably when we sense that the outcome of election do not reflect, you know, our our view to some extent. So then we come up in the streets, and then we publish blogs, and then we write in social media, you know, protesting that 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 really do not reflect. But I think in between, you know, when that is dispensed, and now we are approaching another election, then I think as you have captured, there is a tendency of citizens to sit back and believe in the spirit and in the latter of a delegated power. We sometimes, I think, has led us into trenches because the people we elect, and there is a word, this, the political enterprise that they get, that these political leaders converse all through. But in between that period is purely in meeting the interest of politicians, irregardless of where they are. And they are, you know, accepting one another as the same people, as the same class, and of the same interest. And then Mananji is left on their own. So this is quite stimulating. That the other time we were having a conversation here, you remember Fred, whether Kenyans will only make noise on, on social media and then later, uh, you know, keep quiet up there. But I am tempted to think that citizens are quite strongly resigning into fate and, and believing that the only thing that could be done is have a hope that some leaders would rise up and begin to hold the whole state of the government to account. Yesterday, I saw, um, I, I saw youthful young political leaders congregating together uh, and questioning, you know, beginning to form some caucus of accountability. Could have that happened a long time ago? Yes. The issue about a parliament majority and minority. I think this is also a concept that we should redefine. There is a sense we can have people who are within a caucus cross political parties that can question even the performance of the government, whether they were elected in a ruling coalition or not. But wasn't that the expectation uh, for the first place, that parliament would actually you know, be a cross-political caucus? It's, it's, it's not just a clear line between the majority and minority. It, it, the consciousness of some parliamentarians yes. is shared. Yes. That, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's not really working because I think the, 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 the meddling of you know, our um, uh, parliament within the executive, because this is one of the things I keep on saying, that a parliamentarian is thinking probably about the next election. Mm. And how would he not or she antagonize the party that gave him the certificate? 
-hmm. towards this. So they are worry, and it, it, it's on political parties across. Your worry as a member of parliament probably could be what happens if I antagonize my own coalition or party mm -hmm. uh, with questioning what the executive do and the head of executive is the head of state and is a political party leader that I belong to. So until that is quite taking a lot of risks. In fact, members of parliament that you saw yesterday questioning, if you look at Kinley, probably have raised issues within their political parties. Mm -hmm. And they are now looking at like they are dissatisfied by the current state of affairs. But that is quite coming at a risk to them, especially that now they are looking forward to an election. So our political you know, uh, nature and our political party system really infringe on the rights of independent thought in parliament. Okay. And we don't blend them to that. Let's take a break now. When we come back, we'll continue examining whether or not uh, this uh, corruption and ethics survey report that we expect to be released today could actually be consequential. Why waste the money if at all uh, the data will just be sitting somewhere and gathering dust on some shelves? You're watching Morning Cafe on TV 47.
Cafe on TV 47. I'm still in studio with Daniel Orogo and Joseph Kamanya, political analysts. And we continue looking at this discussion. We started off with uh, looking at our governor's structures and democracy and how it morphs and marries into the issues that we are facing today, including the fight against corruption and Bonacamania, even as we expect and anticipate this corruption and ethics survey report to be released today. Mm. Many are asking, so what will be the consequence of it? Um, and uh, earlier on, we were talking with my colleague, Stan Lee, and saying it's akin to a doctor giving a prescription and telling you, yes, you have malaria. malaria. But then what? <laughs> after that prescription. Uh, what we need as a country is treatment of the ailments. Today we're going to be given a very good diagnosis mm. of which ministry is the most corrupt, which county is the most corrupt. But yeah. then again, after that, what? Yeah. It's a sorry state, because I remember our own very Patrick Lumumba tried to educate Kenyans on how to deal with this animal called corruption. And uh, for a long time he's been talking about, like, you get the leaders that you deserve because you elect people that are a reflection of your aspirations, whether you want to uh, accept that or not. Which that, that is democracy. That is so-called <laughs> democracy. <laughs> so it, it goes back, it narrows down to the power of the people. There may not be something we can do today. Once we are told that there may be the, the traffic police are the most corrupt or this ministry has lost so much money. But in time, as citizens of this country, we need to start rising up and saying, we are going to elect so and so in hope of, because like we've been talking of uh, <clears throat> script here is that a lot happens towards the election. A lot of promise, a lot of aspiration, a lot of hope is invoked in people, but immediately after that process of voting in uh, an administration, the, the, the rhetorics change. Uh, the story now begins to be about we need to settle scores, we need to focus on this and the other, we need to collect more resources. But once that happens, there is no really a directed and deliberate output. I have always maintained the position that it's not about how much on source revenue we can raise as a country. It is about the system and the structures we have of managing the little resources we are able to, to have. That is the only time we'll be able to curb this animal called corruption. And I think before they give us a report, they need to define to us what is corruption in Kenya. So that we don't deal with a white elephant that keeps changing shape and form mm -hmm. depending on the shade of the light in the room. Because that is what has been happening. So it's very sad to know that we're expecting to hear that corruption is thriving in a country where we are struggling to manage the little resources that we have. So at what point and what will it take? Even for those who are able to tell us that this is how corrupt we are, what is their prescription? The prescription you're talking about that you have malaria. You can give people malaria nets like we saw the other day, billions of money, which is very questionable, is being directed to distribution of malaria nets. What are the mitigative uh, measures can we take as a state? Because you get arrested today, they'll tell you, don't bribe the policeman, go to court. You go to court, they tell you, don't bribe the prosecutor, deal with the judge. Why can it not be just seamless that this is a crime, this is the offense you've committed, this, you know, because mostly they lean towards the police. But corruption goes beyond that. You've heard of a tendering, you know, the, the tenderpreneurs. You've heard of uh, instances whereby uh, now, it takes us back to the, the new president fresh from the prison, whereby you have people uh, who have politically associated allegations and they are taken to court. Mm -hmm. So this brings, and they are held accountable and for, the case continues for a prolonged time, period of time. But again, when the system changes, these people are said they were free, these were politically instigated allegations, they can have back their money, they can have back their political positions and move on with life. At what point are we going to have judicial independence? Mm -hmm. At what point are we going to have electoral justice? At what point are we going to have proper utilization of our national resources? Mm -hmm. These are the questions we need to answer. We don't need reports. We don't need KQ telling us they have narrowed down to 22 billion of mm -hmm. laws. For how long are you going to have that? Okay. It, the question now uh, arises on the participation of uh, the citizenry. Yes, we say power belongs to the people, but really, does this form of governance structure really allow for people to exercise their power uh, consequentially beyond the ballot? 
Because right now, as it says, and we've been discussing this, after the elections of 2022, the next time we can have a say as a people, despite the fact that we may understand what is ailing this country, oh. is in 2027. Yeah. And by 2027, our thinking will be clouded because of the campaigns. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, that, that probably would suffer through, uh, you know, a constant extreme political rhetoric. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and Kenyans would actually uh, forget the accountability responsibility uh, that they, they, they have. Um, there, is, there was an attempt, you know, I remember previous election, especially with the understanding of the Kenyan new constitution, when there's a whole resources that were given both domestically and internationally was invested in educating the citizens of the Republic who understand what this constitution was all about. So you saw a lot of civic education, for example, about what the constitution is, mm. you know, what the Bill of Rights, you know, enshrined in the constitution is all about, you know, what is these different chapters of chapter six, ethics and all this. So there's, there's a huge, there was a huge investment uh, in terms of trying to make Mananchi understand the shifts in uh, the legal documents and especially in the transition of the old constitution to the new one. Mm -hmm. There was a very good trend in making the citizens purely understand and participate thereafter. But I think the successive regimes, um, you know, clamp down on any effort or any initiative to raise the citizens aware about their level of participation and especially their rights to participate in this particular public affair. You understand that this was, is purely the work, matters of continuous civic education the law has enshrined that to IABC. I mean, it's in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. That it, it, it does not only evokes uh, or be evoked to only reflect voter education. Mm -hmm. Civic education should be a process that goes on through. It's not just about how to cast your ballot. You know, ballot. just how to cast your ballot. And, 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 and Fred, that is constitutionally given to IABC. And unfortunately, we are discussing an IABC. That, doesn't that even, the commissioner, <laughs> even the commissioners, you know, even in the world, leave alone even the commissioners, even the recruitment panel has not been discussed. Mm -hmm. That is the body that has been given the role yeah. to educate but, the but, citizens. But you see, so, even this same constitution, because it was supposed to remedy all these things through so many institutions, through so many independent uh, institutions, through even some provisions of even recalling members of, the, of parliament, yes. yet it would appear that the citizenry in Kenya has come to an acceptance that they have no power after the ballot until the next ballot. What I am attributing that is that at some level, just as the way we are raised through an education system uh, that teaches us an education for life and education for skills and expertise, we should also have a process of public education. And this public education should also give us skills and competence, including litigation and accountability. That is what I'm seeing. And as we speak, that is not foreseeable because the institutions that are there failed. Now going into the contents of what Kenyans should be made aware of, which now speaks about, I talked about rights. I talked about even rising up and casting your vote. And that means that the question the citizens should have, especially now, is what happens if by any means I casted my vote and then I realized later mm -hmm. that this particular leader is not delivering. The only constitution power that we are given is a recall clause. And even this attaining that recall clause, it's not even practical. Because as you look into it, it's some, I think it should be some months before election. Mm. You should not recall your leader. And also for a few months, or probably some years after election. So that means that, that, that you're, you're in between here, and especially that particular, you are not able to exercise that. By, by means, in the, my, my colleague Kamanya said, it has been made difficult. It has been made difficult by default that citizens cannot be able to exercise fully, especially in the exercise of their political rights. Political rights. Mm -hmm. Other rights, fine, they would go to court and question. And that is why 
citizens sometimes even vilify what Okia is doing mm -hmm. and the rest of other litigants that are rising up and questioning what the government is doing. Matters of ethnicity has even clouded the issues of nationality. As a Kenyans, do we have you know, a Kenyan as, as a nation where citizens could coalesce on an issue and agree? It, it has happened, especially in 2002, when the entire Republic of Kenya decided to say that right, right now it is enough. You know, the Saitoti is, uh, you know, a philosophy of there comes a time when, you know, a nation is more important than individuals. Mm -hmm. I think Kenyans rallied and say our nation is more important by that time. But I think, like I've said, successive regimes have made it very difficult for Kenyans systematically to exercise that and that has even been made by at the constitutional time, provisions. At a time when the country should be no. more woke yeah. mm -hmm. to what is happening, mm -hmm. we understand and we anticipate even this report on corruption will just be something on paper, we'll be angry for a few days and we'll move on. And we have no way of tackling it. We expect, and you mentioned it, that we hope that the leaders we elected will take care of it. We know they've not taken care of it. When was the last time we had our leadership? talk about the fight against corruption. How should we, should we really, is it a legitimate expectation we should have on this leadership? <clears throat> Fred, uh, the country has ease, because I, I think it's uh, very important that we remain pragmatic. The country has ease is in a limbo, because we have, uh, we have no opposition. Uh, remember, everything that led to the NADCO was due to the cost of living, which is a non-issue today. Nobody talks about it. Uh, we have thousands of students who, have, who will not be going back to second term and who have not yet joined high school. And their positions we've had have been sold. Is that not corruption? Mm -hmm. By the head teachers of those particular schools. Uh, we have doctors on the streets. Why? Because the CBA has not been honored. Is that not corruption? Mm -hmm. Corruption is not just the theft or mm -hmm. taking of actual money. It is the defaulting on policies outlined by our constitution. It is the defaulting on the aspiration of the citizens through the delegated power of the, to the leaders that we have elected. It is the defaulting of not fulfilling the public policy that has been promised upon by the administration in power. So when this happens, the question ought to be not how corrupt we are and who is more corrupt than the other. The question ought to be what do we do as a people? What do we do as a nation? Because you're going to have a report, and you and I know nothing much is going to change from what is written until we have some action. So we need a multifaceted agency that will be fully independent, because you've just spoken about the IBC. That should be the crux of shaping our homegrown democracy. But it is highly been decapitated. Mm -hmm. It has been made sure it is a dead animal. Allocation of resources only happen a few months to the election and they only, it just seems that they're given money to oversee the election process. After that, the main purpose, which was supposed to be continued civic education, remains compromised. So we need our organizations and our agencies to really come up and execute their mandate, execute their service Charter. All these ministries, all these agencies, all these organizations, they have the service charter. But it is never spoken about. So we cannot now then start to have the Monainchi take the blame and the load of dealing with corruption when the system itself is flawed. Mm -hmm. When the system itself is a fraud, actually. Mm -hmm. There are things that we need to deal with this country seriously. And I think it's only going to take uh, us young leaders now coming out and talking about it. Remember the last election we had 30% of registered voters, most of them who are the young people that did not vote. Okay. Reason being, they did not see any hope or any interest in getting invo involved in the electioneering process. Mm -hmm. We need to start changing that. My question is, are we that helpless? Um, fine. Uh, last week we were having discussions about uh, the fact that it would appear President William Ruto and his administration are simply having their way on every uh, single idea or yes. policy mm -hmm. that they come up with, that it will definitely see, even if it experiences a few hurdles, uh, legal hurdles, at the end of the day, the affordable housing uh, Sell through. Pro program is now law. The SHIF is on course. Mm. Um, everything else, including proposals for new taxation, will see the light of day, whether or not we complain. Uh, but. Uh, 
Is, is it really that way? Or are we seeing uh, instances of a reawakening, especially in the Mount Kenya region, with the beginning of questions arising on whether or not some of this taxation can actually um, go on. Ma uh -huh. You mentioned the Mount Kenya region, but before we allude to that, mm. you mentioned earlier the cross-party, uh, cross-political party caucus is not effective uh, in our parliament. And remember, that was the initial, one of the main uh, core issues when it came to the NADCO conversation. They were saying there were a lot of uh, political party interference by the government uh, to the opposition. And that is where the rain started beating us. Because we should have competent MPs like Dan in parliament, mm -hmm. who is able to rise on an ideology much as it may differ with the political party that he comes from position and say, for the interest of the nation that I do serve, because a member of parliament, you're a legislature. You don't just go there to advocate for your constituency. You advocate for the interest of the entire nation, just that you come from a certain political background. But we don't have that. We've seen members of parliament, and I think even on this platform it has been uh, confirmed, they have been gagged by the political party's position and they are told, do not talk about this issue, or if should you talk about it, go and speak on it in this manner. That needs to come to an end. There is no autonomy at all of the legislation that is sitting in parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, if a certain direction, and you have confirmed this, they will say even before a bill passes, we know it is going to sail through. We have brown uh, envelopes, we'll be meeting in the washrooms, and then we're going to get our numbers. And you look at the numbers and you realize these numbers exceed the, let's say, the, the majority side. That means the minority were compromised and they crossed over. These are the issues we need to deal with. We need autonomy in leadership in parliament. Because do, do, do you see hope in that happening this time around, especially, and that's why I brought in the Mount Kenya yeah. factor, because <laughs> now you're seeing MPs saying, no, that has to change, that has to change. If at all they're going to change it, it has to be in the current process of the finance <laughs> bill uh, 2024, that they could actually reverse some of the taxation measures. I think 2024, 2025, a finance uh, bill is going to be very catastrophic for the country. There is no hope on that one. No, All this, no, no hope of any change. There is no hope. It's going to get worse. <laughs> uh, if you look, uh, like we had this taxation uh, being imposed on uh, freehold title deeds. And people say, no, constitutionally, it is illegal. We need to repeal some of these uh, provisions in the constitution. Now, let's move on to Mount Kenya because this is very interesting. Uh, it has gotten very slippery for, for anybody aspiring to be like the Mount Kenya kingpin and then uh, congregate or convince uh, the, the Mount, uh, Mount Kenya people that our votes should go this way. For a long time, there is a conversation that has been killed almost. One man, one vote, one shilling. If there is any democracy in this nation, that ought to be the direction we take. Because we should not take resources from Dan and give them to you, yet you do not deserve them. Okay? <laughs> At the expense of his own development. Are you saying, Bonacomania, that uh, we will see more of the same? That the uh, executive, the president, will continue having his way, whether or not there are mamas in Mount Kenya or any other region? I mean, without a shadow of doubt, as evidenced by what you've been, you know, this is a evidence-based conversation we are, <laughs> we are having. Uh, what, so, what, what do you think that uh, with, with the mamas in Mount Kenya, then probably there's hope that something will change, that uh, tax on um, taxation measures on avocado and other f fresh produce has to be reversed. If at all they manage to reverse any of those provisions, that will be a positive step. I mean, how would they, how would they reverse that? Because there's already a legislation that has been passed uh, in the, in Through the, the next uh, uh, finance bill, they could reverse any taxation. I, I mean, they, they, that could be that could be that could be a leeway of hope if 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 this kind of uh, you know um, uh, you know uh, activities we are seeing that is arising from Mount Kenya can be replicated, can be intensified, but also can be actualized in parliament and also actualized in, in in parliament, but also in different regions. Because you see, Mount Kenya, what is happening in Mount Kenya is by the fact that the realization, the awakening, uh, that we do not have a competent and a quality representation and presentation in parliament mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Because it's quite sad, Fred. How would, you, how would you ask for a bill? How would you call for a bill to be tabled? 
And I'm just reading, you know, one of the stars where, you know, someone asking that MPs should listen to those who elect them and referencing the finance bill. That in the House of Represent Representation, some members of parliament are already, they already know this will pass and they're asking you, instead of vetting that bill and putting your, you know, your submissions, they're urging the speaker to put, you know, the bill to, to be voted. You understand? They already know the way they would want to vote without looking at the contents of what is this kind of bill that we want to vote to become an act of parliament, or rather to be, to be a finance act. So while that is being interrogated, it's quite important also that Kenyans begin to look keenly. Now that we are talking about democracy that works for us, that ought to work for us, is to really go back for us and understand the quality of representation that we have in who are we sending to represent us in parliament. But then that would uh, reduce us to the ballot uh, only. And that's what I'm saying, mm -hmm. because that is where probably we have a lot of decisions, Fred. That is probably these where MPs, we make a lot of These MPs of, appear to decisions. have identified we, we a should, few offending clauses we, we in should, the Finance Act. They have an opportunity to reverse or to remove those offending clauses this time around but, as they but, process the uh, next finance bill. Are we saying which, there's no hope at all? Which, which has, which has, that was what I'm saying, and I agree with Kamanya, <laughs> which has to go through yes. the parliament. Yes. And the parliament as it is, that's what we are vetting here. The yeah. parliament as it is. Can One, do this, is this, this is a legacy initiative for the president, an executive, affordable housing, you know, tax regimes. These, 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 are, these, these are legacy. So you telling me that a member of parliament would want to defer and become into contradiction on the taxation of fresh produce, so I think, especially. I think yes. it's not going, it's not going to. It, it would uh, happen. Yeah. Taxation on fresh produce. <clears throat> you know, Fred, we struggle to defend uh, any proposals from the government because we still are latching on that there is hope on uplifting the common money. Mm -hmm. For a long time, uh, this government was about Mamamboga, Botomap, Mtua Boda Boda, and all that. But when you now pass on the burden of taxation to the farmer who has been selling their fruit, an avocado fruit, for five shillings, and then you're saying they should pay even if it's just 50 cents, yet we all know on the production chain, uh, cost of production is passed on to the consumer. The consumer of the farmer is the person who buys to go and resell. Mm -hmm. They're the one who should shoulder that burden. Therefore, like I said, the system itself is flawed. Mm -hmm. It is not being structured in a manner of uplifting the common person that we purport to serve. That one is going to collapse. I can tell you no person in Mount Kenya and any MP who dares <laughs> Who dares to, pro to... They have an opportunity to, to adjust, make adjustments. If they don't make adjustments, I can tell you for free, they'll be going home, all of them, come 2027. Mm -hmm. The other thing... But if they successfully make adjustments, it would mean that there is hope that uh, you could actually reverse some of this, that uh, the president may not necessarily be having his way in e on each and every But then let's look at the flip side of this, uh -huh. because this is something that we never talk about, yet we know it is a reality of the day. This government is not raising enough resources to drive the development agenda. So by any means necessary, they are going to squeeze as much money as they can to raise capital for development and repayment of debts. Wow. The only place they can find this is any place that there is existing financial activity. And there'll be so no going back on there'll that. There'll be no going back on that. Again, I like reminding people when we are campaigning for this administration, it was loudly and clearly uh, articulated by the president that our source of revenue will be taxation. People just either never understood that or they never cared about it. But he was very clear that taxation will be the way to go. Lazima, sisi, tujitegeme, ndio tujenge, uchomiwetu. I don't know how now we don't understand that. Now, remember there was the talk about expansion of the tax bracket. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets to pay as little as they can so that we have more. That is exactly what's happening. That is what is happening. People either did not listen or they did not understand. Civic education remains our way of finding our freedom, financial freedom in our time, like yeah. the South Africans are saying. Finally, Come on, do you one think county. They didn't understand? <laughs> I mean, then why are we complaining if we understood <laughs> I, I, this? I, I mean, do you think they didn't understand or they, they just. They just understood, but they wanted to make a statement. Hey, gentlemen, I'll give each one of no, you a minute you know, and a half for yeah, your final okay. comments. <laughs> Let's start with you, Bola as you finish. Yes. Uh, 
It's a sad day today that our doctors are in the streets. That needs to be addressed as soon as yesterday. It is also a sad day to see that the revelations of Shakahola, you know, are coming out and, you know, I want to control with the families. And again also, the students that we lost, uh, the KU road accident. These are issues that touch each and every Kenyan. So today, let's tone down the political rhetorics. Let's look at how we can free uh, ourselves from these uh, financial uh, traps that we are in as a country. Corruption is not something that is going to be addressed by any foreign agency. We need home-based and homegrown solutions to deal with corruption. One man, one vote, one shilling. <laughs> one county, one product is the only thing that is going to drive our financial development agenda. That would have come with a uh, delimitation <laughs> of boundaries. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, <laughs> whose deadline I mean, has already lapsed. Quite, 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 quite interesting. <laughs> We're looking at it helplessly. Yeah, helplessly. We're watching everything else. Yeah. Quite interesting. Uh, this is coming from Kamanya. And, and I think one, one man, one shilling, one vote was was probably rejected during the, the building yeah. <laughs> initiative report yeah. when it was proposed. And I think citizens are coming to realization. My, 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 my winding statement, Fred, uh, I think that there is, we've discussed elaborately that there seems to be a simmering hope uh, you know, arising from the continent and the wave of understanding uh, the need for regimic change, uh, the an opportunity to give a space to relatively young people and just infusing fresh blood in the whole democratic and governance system. As to why the, it will work or not, and I think it's something that should be tried. The let us understand that you know, it is quite important to give young people space to exercise and to lead because they are not just leaders of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. They are the leaders of today. And uh, you know, the timidity that, uh, you know, the strength the diversity that we require coming, you know, from freshness and, uh, you know, uh, creativity of these young people. And lastly, I think it's quite important, I keep on maintaining uh, that our internal vigilance is quite important. Uh, the citizens have a right to exercise and citizens have a right and they should, the obligations also come uh, with it that they ought to take part on the political life of a nation. And while they do this, then they will reduce and questioning, they will own up to their responsibilities that they take and equally you know, um, exercise that freedom in a manner uh, that is within line in the rule of law and enshrining the constitution under the Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. Corruption in a sense should be dealt with uh, by us just owning that you know, it, it comes from us as well. I mean, corruption is not just a concept where we see to the elected leaders. Mm -hmm. We should look at ourselves and the moment we try to bribe people, because there is give and take, mm -hmm. our responsibilities as citizens in the exercise of this particular issue must also be put into question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel Orogo. And, just and since we will not benefit, it's good to wish uh -huh. our brothers and sisters from a Christian family you know, a happy Easter holiday, okay. because we might not be back on set again All right. within this time. You know. Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Daniel Orogo. And just for uh, Kamanya, our panelists this morning, political commentators, um, helping us understand some of the uh, difficult or dicey discussions that we should be having as a nation as we go forward. Let's uh, go straight to our editorial comment this morning. Now, today, the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission will release um, results of the 2023 National Ethics and Corruption Survey. The report provides data on the perceptions, magnitude, forms, and levels of corruption both in the county and national governments. It also ranks ministries, departments, agencies, and counties based on perceived corruption levels. But what is the value of conducting surveys if such initiatives fail to reverse the trend? What is the point of knowing which government ministry or county government is the most corrupt if the data collected just ends up gathering dust on a shelf somewhere serving no purpose at all? As Kenyans, we are already acutely aware that the scourge of corruption, especially within government institutions, is at embarrassingly high levels. We are forced to interact with this fact every single day of our lives. What we need right now is not more diagnosis of the problem, but rather a prescription to treat the ailment. Anything short of that is an exercise in futility. Haven't we seen enough high-profile corruption cases withdrawn from court due to lack of evidence in recent months? 
When was the last time we witnessed a conviction in a corruption-related case in Kenya? We seem to have made corruption part of the system, and we even actively budget for it.